Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and the subject of today's video, well, we're going to take a look at a case study which is a DOE that doesn't have measurable data. So, oops, let's get a better pen than that. It's a DOE case study. don't have measurable data. So in theory, it's pass-fail data. Now we're going to have a little look at the DOE pattern, we're going to have a look at the graphs and we're going to have a look at the regression. But before we do that I want to talk about how you deal with pass-fail data because of course in theory the sample size should be in thousands and you know famously Dorian Shanin who invented component swapping and pairwise comparison and things like that Shanin techniques you know he said if you do not have a measurable if you do not have a measurable scale invent one you know everything can be put on a measurable scale if you think creatively about it so what do we do with pass fail data well what we're going to do is we're going to grade the quality. We're going to grade the quality. Now all of these components are cosmetic in nature. I've got an example of a component here. You can see it's a molded part. It's not particularly um, dimensional. Um, there are some simple dimensions that we're trying to adhere to, but they're not really critical, there's no fancy tolerance in or anything like that. But the surface finish, the way the plastic and the mould reacts is very important. This is a very special engineering material, so the, the, the cosmetic is super important to the quality of the item. And of course what that tends to mean is we tend to go pass-fail. But what I'm going to get them to do, I'm going to get them to grade the quality 1 to 5. And 5, 5 is the minimum. So we don't want to go 1 to 4 or 1, 2, 3. 5 is the minimum. Because what we're trying to do, 5 if you think about it, is the minimum number of categories I would need if I tried to create some kind of histogram of what's going on. So we're going to come up with one to five. So in other words, what we're going to do, we're going to mould an, a normal sample size for this. So instead of going pass fail, where we want thousands, we're sort of going to go 30 to 50. 30 to 50 as a sample size. So let's take a look at the data. So here is the data look. We've got a four factor problem. Four factors at two levels. So we have 16 runs. You can see the 16 runs here and you can see the four factors. So tool temperature, barrel temperature, etc. Cure time. Um, so you can see the factors there. You can see the results. You can see the way I've graded them. Now what we've simply done so what we've simply done here, we've put them next to one another. So if you put them next to one another, you can easily see, by the way, 5 is bad, 1 is good. But if you put them next to one another, it's very easy to see that this one maybe is better than this one. And therefore that sort of puts it in a scale. Then if you get one that's better, you can put it this side and you can very quickly build up at least five categories. So if you look back at the data table, here we are, you can see, look, it's working quite well. There are a few results where we get some variability. So we get some ones and fives in the same row. But pretty much, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing the same results across the same row, which is giving us a good sense that this is working. We're also seeing, look, the top half is clearly not as good as the bottom half. 
So we've clearly seen some good signals in the data. This is working really well. Now what I'm going to do, look, I'm going to look at the marginal means plot. So if we look at the S marginal means plot, we can see the factor there that's driving the marginal means plot, which is the, um, the cure time. That's driving the standard deviation, it's uh, driving the variability. You can see on the other uh, graph, it is the tool temperature. So if we look at shift in the mean, what makes them better or worse? If we look on the Y hat marginal means, you can see the big signal there on the left hand side that's driving the quality overall. So one is driving the consistency of the quality, the S, one is driving the position of the quality, the Y. Now what I've then done, look, is I've gone through and I've created a regression equation. The regression equation, look, has only ended up with two main effects in it and the AC interaction. So we've ended up with A and C and the AC interaction. I've got a great R squared, which is 0.64, you wouldn't expect higher R-squareds than this because of the 1 to 5 scale. It creates a little bit more noise in your data because you don't have true measurable data. But now what I can do, of course, is I can ask the computer to give me the best settings. So what we've done, we've gone at this two separate ways. We've asked the optimizer two optimization techniques. So number one is to use the optimizer. And ask the optimizer to minimize the number. Because of course one here is the best result. So you can see, look, in the yellow fields here, we've got these four settings that, is, that they are our recommended optimized values. Right? The second technique though is simple. Pick a winner. Pick a winner. So if I go back to the yellow data table, if we look at the yellow data table here, Look, there is a row here where we got all ones across the row. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take those four settings and we're going to do a, a confirmation test with those four settings. So what I've recommended to this client is they try a confirmation test with the optimizer values. They try a confirmation test with the pick a winner values. By the way, something that's important about the pick a winner values, it's actually a faster cycle. So if that works, that's a much better, that's a much better uh, optimized set of settings than what the computer's picked. Bear in mind, the computer's stupid. It doesn't know that this is a faster or slower cycle, but we know this by looking at the, by looking at the settings. So now what the client's got to do, they've got to go back, do the two confirmation tests, see what they learn, make sure that the model confirms, and then we'll pick the best settings, lock them in, and we'll just make shed loads of money with lower defect rates and a faster cycle time. But that's how to do a DOE. So this DOE case study, that's how to do a DOE when what you have is pass-fail data. Invent a scale. Come up with a clever way of grading one to five. If you hold the parts next to one another, the grading will work very well and be very accurate. You'll get the DOE done. You won't have to do thousands of data points. And hey, you'll make more money. And what we don't have to do, the aim of this, by the way, the aim of this project is so that they don't have to keep inspecting the, the part off the, off the moulding machine because they keep doing inspection but it's pass fail in nature 
What do you think of a data point of one if it's pass fail? Well, it's telling them very little. What we want to do is get optimized settings where we guarantee the quality. We don't have to do any inspection at all. That's the power of DOE, but that's what you've got to do. Grade the quality, get rid of pass fail, make the DOE work, make more money.